Hi, everybody. Welcome into another edition. This is Cross Functionality, the show, the podcast where coaching intersects male and female baseball and softball, hosted by former college baseball and softball players. And by we, I, I say that every week. We, I mean myself and my friend, co host, national champion at the University of Alabama as a softball player. I did watch that national championship game over the week we'll get to that yeah. as we move along in this show it was a lot of fun i got a chance to watch the full <laughs> game on youtube cassie riley bosha renowned uh, current day coach swiss army knife herself what's going on <laughs> how's it going how's it going i'm excited about excited about this this talking about the championships always fun yeah yeah i was watching that game i, I got a chance to finally uh, because i watched highlights of it and mm. and youtube and ncaa on youtube they put that game up and i watched the entire game. i did not know jess mendoza was right in the middle calling the game oh, so you yeah, got a yeah. chance to meet the legend herself who i think she's a true pioneer in this business or you know the softball industry broadcasting industry in general and she's got a great mind for baseball despite what some people may think and you got a chance to meet her it's pretty cool you know what she's been so heavily involved in softball and then even even through my life i got to grow up watching her on team usa and she was this big lefty power hitter not in size though in what she produced and i always resonated with that i was like okay this is a girl who's like she's not that much bigger than me like and she hits the ball like she's got a big swing so i was always in love with her swing um, one of my mentors was actually used to do clinics with her. So I knew of her through someone that I was very close with and just I got to hear stories about her, hear how her, she appreciated and loved the game. Um, and yes, she's been overly involved in softball, does so much for the sport. And then, you know, it was one of those things I remember, I distinctly remember um, I had finished writing my book, you know, this is a couple of years, this is 2013, I, I guess at that time. And I was like, you know what? What's the worst that happens? She could just not respond or say no. And I just sent her an email. I said, hey, here's my manuscript. I'd love to have you do a review on the back of my book. <laughs> and let me know what you think. And she got back to me and she did it, which is just says a lot about her, which is super cool. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I encourage everybody to go check out that game on YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. It was actually a really good game, too. They, yeah. It, it, you know what? There was a lot. I, I'm always biased, but um, I do think it was a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, and today, episode nine, we're talking, wrapping up our series. The last few weeks, we've talked to you, and we've reflected on the national championship and the entire series, the game last week, the actual clinching game today. We're talking about the aftermath. Next week, we'll be discussing some untold stories from your college career and um, the things that you've never told before, and maybe that you haven't even told in the book. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to be discussing that next week. This week, though, looking back at... Um, the aftermath of that championship. A couple of things I want to bring up, though. I saw a video on your Instagram. I really enjoyed it at Coach underscore Cassie RB on Instagram, at Coach Cassie RB on Twitter. I'm at Jim Tara on Twitter, but I saw that video and you talked about discussing um, what scouts look for in hitters mm -hmm. and that discussion that you had. Uh, let's elaborate a little bit on that. I think you yeah. being a hitting gal yourself, um, it was a lot of that was that was really cool to see and and. Um, get a chance to hear you talk to scouts and there's so many things uh, that that so many ways I can go with this um, but I want to just get your 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 feel um, with with how you felt talking with those scouts and what they look for in hitters you know what it was interesting because um, I was expecting to hear so many different types of answers I was expecting mm -hmm. to hear you know well, the, the LA guy is going to say one thing and then the Pirates guy might say another thing. And, you know, of course, I just had an opportunity to be around all these guys that I was I was nonstop asking questions, asking questions. Mm -hmm. And I think with the biggest differentiator that or like, you know, what we really have to realize in hitting is that there's people who are purely evaluators and then there's people who are going to be in a position of developing. And, you know, the metrics, the. Um, seeing what someone's exit velocity is, seeing what someone's bat velocity, all those things have a place and they're important, but they're not what these guys are looking at to evaluate someone's ability to, to at least get that initial look. And I thought that was super neat. And, and I did ask about that a lot. I think that was one of the biggest things, you know, people were like, well, I want to see if they get the barrel. And then I'd say, okay, well, are you looking for a particular metric or anything? He goes, honestly, he goes, I have seen some of the best exit velocity guys ever. Like, unbelievably impressive in BP. He goes, and they can't put it together in games. He goes, so if they're not barreling up people in games, he's like, that just tells me they're not seeing the ball. And that was like probably the most profound thing that anyone had said where if they can't see the ball initially off of good pitching, he, all that other stuff doesn't even matter at the time. 
You know, we have uh, Ricky Reimold on this week for filling in for Epp on the Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast, and he's had a great career um, as a scout, as a pitching coach now at the University of Missouri at Mizzou. He was the pitching coordinator for the Mets, and he talked about when he was a scout, talked about this with me when he was scouting with the Cardinals, how he wanted to blend analytics and metrics with scouting and he with the just the grassroots scouting and he wanted mm-hmm. to be at the forefront of that and i just wonder if there's still that disconnect there not only disconnect between scouting and we're talking scouting in general not just hitters but just with scouting and player evaluation as it pertains that disconnect with analytics and also player development once players do reach professional baseball yeah yeah, you know, I think we're dying so badly to have an A plus B equals C or like right. make it a little bit more black and white, make it less subjective, make it um, a little bit more like, hey, you know what? We found this thing in common with the top 50 people who got recruited and we can look for that one metric or these two metrics or whatever it is. Like, I think we really want to try to find that um, or just a way to describe uh, a hitter too, like we can talk about a pitcher and we can, you know, people are starting to understand like, wow, this person has a ton of vertical break. This person um, has an arm slot at this position, this, you know, whatever it may be. Um, We're starting to understand what uh, metrics describe a really effective pitcher, but we have some of our best hitters in the world that aren't always aligning on metrics. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So it is, it, it is interesting. Hitting is, will always be this a little bit of anomaly because there's two massive skills involved. There's the skill of moving your body and then the skill of interpreting a pitch. And you can have someone who is supreme in one, let's say really, really great at being able to interpret a pitch. And they can, I think that affords them the ability to lack a little bit in the other two, because they can make up for it a little bit. Um, And you have other people who have these tremendous swings who just can't, you know, all of a sudden pitching gets really great and they can't put it all together all the time. So um, it, it is it is difficult um, to to do. I don't know if it'll ever be done where it's like a perfect world scenario, but I do think why not try? Why not continue to look at all this data and see what we can come up with and, and how close we can get to what we're searching for? I, I wonder, and I don't know if any um, scouts that you talked to um, told you this, um, off the record, but I do wonder if certain scouts or just a scout in general, if he's looking at a hitter, if he looks for something in particular, um, fundamentally that he likes, that he says to himself, okay, for example, that guy is a great, great hand path. That guy is a great swing plane. That guy gets great extension. That guy gets great leverage. And it's some, it's a biased fundamental that they look for in that player that allows them to better envision what their career is going to be like at professional baseball at the professional level. So the most consistent thing I've heard, uh, I heard at least that day. And again, this is one perspective from one day. There's so many, there's so many other aspects to major league baseball, right. And to what scouts look for. But the most consistent thing was that slow to fast. Um, How long can they hold their, their weight in their backside for? How long can they hold that before they are falling into their front pitch? And when they do take, are they landing super hard on their front side, looking like they almost got fooled? Or are they in that quiet stance where they they knew for a long time, like, you know what, that wasn't the pitch I wanted. So the ability to hold that weight back until, right, delayed intent, slow to fast, I think a lot of people have different ways of, of, of wording it. Um, that just seemed to be the main thing that they were really looking for, like, when because you could see that on almost every – they didn't have to actually swing the bat for you to see how that was going to affect their, their performance. Yeah, because there's so much arguing on hitting Twitter, as we've talked about on and – away from the microphone. Um, and, and the one thing that we forget when we when we visit that that cesspool, we'll call it, of hitting Twitter, is that scouts know a lot about hitting. They know a lot about pitching. Um, I just called you the Swift, Swiss Army Knife. Scouts are a lot in a lot of ways are like the Swiss Army Knife of baseball. They understand pitching. They understand base running. They understand fundamentals. They understand how to coach if need be. Um, but we, t- we we focus so much on mechanics and fundamentals. That's why I'm, I was very curious mm. to hear from you if, if scouts do look for certain mechanics um, and if they are very strong-willed in what a certain mechanics a player should actually have that's going to help them succeed. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's some out there, but, I mean, I kept trying to find – I kept trying to see that question because, right, like <clears> – <throat> You hear youth coaches, you hear high school coaches all the time. They're looking, and, and that is the conversation, mechanics, 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 mechanics. And a, a girl comes in, I'm like, what are we working on? She goes, not dropping my back shoulder. Yeah. And it's, you know, maybe the conversation should be a little bit more 
less internally focused, right? Because mechanics is just such a small piece or a piece of hitting, not all of it. Um, yeah, I really, I kept trying to probe. I kept trying to be like, come on, like, give me that, give me that thing. And they're kind of <laughs> like, you know, it just, the other thing of it too, is what I think people need to understand is they're not evaluating little league hitters. They're evaluating guys who have risen to the cream of the crop. Everyone has pretty good mechanics at that point. Everyone looks fairly clean at that point. And if maybe there's a tweak or two, that's going to help them a little bit. Um, that's not, I guess what their, their main focus is at the time. Um, yeah, that's I, I, you know, maybe maybe that was just a, maybe I was getting a veiled answer, or maybe that's just what the consensus is. I do wonder. I was watching um, a couple of shortstops that were drafted this past year. I won't name the shortstop, but he had a very big leg kick and a lot of moving parts. And this was somebody who was not very big at all. A lot of moving parts. I, I'm I'm listen. I'm a proponent of the leg kick as long as it actually does something. I'm not right. I'm not talking about the leg kick just to do a leg kick. I'm talking about if you actually get into your legs and it helps a little bit, that is helping with Albert Pujols is getting into sure. his legs more and with the leg kick. Um, but there is somebody that was drafted that had that big, as a big leg kick, a lot of moving parts. I wouldn't want, if I'm a scout, I wouldn't want him at, to draft him as a hitter because I feel like if he struggles and with all those moving parts, it's going to take, and this is a first rounder getting paid a lot of money mm. to sign it's going to take him a long time, a fairly long time. And I mean like three, maybe three, four months into a season to fix him mechanically and to get him back to where he needs to be because there is so many moving parts because he is struggling so much and you have to somehow fix that. Right. I'd rather have the guy who has the simple mechanics and can put up the same numbers and has pretty much the same ceiling. Yeah, if, if that is, you know, if you can confidently say like, okay, two guys with the same ceiling, I could totally, totally see that. Um, yeah. And in the same breath, you know, when you look at the human body and you study motor learning, you study how your neuron, right, is sending a signal from your brain to your muscle telling it to move, how solidified those, those pathways are by the time you're even 16, 17, which is why you know, people laugh, they see Gary Sheffield at the Little League World Series or the, in high school with his swing, and it, there's so much that's similar. And you could almost pick out what someone, who someone is, like in an old school video, because their swing hasn't, there, there isn't a tremendous amount of their swing. There's like certain techniques, like Mike Trout is always going to look very similar in his swing. And it's, it is very, very, very difficult to completely rewire your pathways. Because think once, once a pathway solidified, you mm -hmm. can't unwire that you have to just develop a new one. And that's what, that's what becomes so difficult. Why your body wants to go into old compensations because it's what it's used to. It's what it's always done. Um, so it, as an athlete does get older, obviously athleticism and body awareness helps rewire that new pathway, but it is difficult to make massive changes for an athlete uh, post that 16, 17 year old range. Yeah. And again, I guess with this particular person, I, I didn't see, the, I don't see the power output mm -hmm. that he should be getting from that type of light. In other words, I think he's doing the leg kick because it, it's something that, he, that you mentioned right there, that he's already learned and that it's, it's kind of already embedded into his brain, but mm -hmm. it's not really at this point doing much. Not and helping so, his timing, not helping and, power, right. And I'm thinking, okay, well, when he's struggling and you're trying to to make him unlearn, for lack of a better term, make him unlearn that leg kick to simplify things at the plate, and you've got a lot of money at stake with this guy, it's not going to be very easy for an organization to do that. It's not easy to do that on a daily basis, especially. It sounds easier, than, but it's not. Easier said than done, um, especially when these guys are playing every single day. That's tough. I, I don't envy, you know, I remember what it felt like to try to be uh, making adjustments in season when you're playing a 68 game schedule and over the course of a few months and you start to feel very lost. Like there were plenty of times I would take two swings that on video looked very different. And I started to not be able to, you almost become very numb to what your swing feels like. Mm -hmm. And so when you ever hear a coach or someone be like, you know what, take a step away from your swing, come back in a couple days. And people are like, don't swing for two days. Don't swing for three days. It's, there is a reason for it. It's like your, your body resetting to its, its most powerful tendencies. It's, it's best tendencies. Um, yeah. And, and you know what I've, for most of my athletes, because again, to have, uh, you know, the, the coaches that the, or the athletes, I should say that we consider elite who are working in college. I don't get to work with them daily in when they're in college, right. They're, they're usually across the country. 
But the biggest piece of advice is, you know, you, you make sure your strength and your power is where it needs to be in the off season. You're able to create a regimen that maintains that. And then if there is an issue that shows up in season, uh, first thing you ask yourself is if you're actually swinging at pitches you want to hit. And if you're not there, that's more of a visual interpretation that needs to be corrected first. Next is your timing. And if your timing is off again, that's probably a visual interpretation or something to do with your load. And then only after that, if you're like, no, I'm consistently swinging at pitches. I want to hit my timing feels right where it needs to be. And I'm still miss hitting the ball. Now let's go take a look at mechanics. But so many times our timing is going to make our swing look very, very different than what you know, it's probably not a mechanical issue then that we have to address right away. There's probably something else going on prior uh, with our interpretation of, of, of that pitch or our pitcher or how we're preparing for that pitcher that is probably throwing our mechanics off, at least in game, in season. Okay, so let me ask you this then. Would you rather have a hitter who has simple mechanics, solid mechanics, but simple, or someone who has, like this player that I spoke of, uh, a lot of moving parts, a big leg kick and a lot going on with his swing simple or a lot which type of player would you rather have would you rather scout would you rather coach so the player who's a lot has to i think just be really really good in other categories to be worth it right they have to be uh showing plus power showing plus speed showing plus ability to time a pitch up not getting fooled against a really aggr- like really difficult pitcher to read those types of things would be like okay this all over the place, maybe this bigger swing just works for this particular individual. And you know what? It's that would, that would have to be where it's worth it. Right. If they're showcasing that they can, they can prove in other areas. Um, And you said another great thing too, their ceiling, right? Like if you can look at that person and be like, you know what, their potential for power, their potential for development is much, much greater. That's when you take the chance. But if you're trying to, if, if all else is equal, um, it is going to be a lot easier to make those adjustments on someone with a with a uh, simpler swing, or just a very like slow, fast, nothing too crazy, no big barrel movement. That's again all else being equal, that becomes a lot easier to maintain. I had a college coach tell me years ago that a leg kick is just a timing mechanism, and I, I agree to, to some extent. I don't necessarily agree in a lot of cases, and again, I point to Albert Pujols. He has a leg kick this year Mm -hmm. and it's gotten a little bit him more into his backside. It's gotten him into his legs. It's gotten him more balanced. So sometimes, you know, a leg kick does really help. Um, You look at A-Rod, for example, he had a leg kick. Mm -hmm. It got him into his legs. It got him leverage, even though he wasn't really all that firm on his front side. So I, I, I am a believer in the leg kick. Don't get me wrong, but if it's not doing anything and you, you've got a hitch in your swing, a lot of movement with the upper body, and this really isn't giving you more power output, I just don't see the point to it. And I, I think personally, my opinion that if you're, this person goes into a slump, this person is struggling you as a coach in player development, you as an organization, you might have a tough time trying to wheel them back in and get them to where they need to be. I mean, I look at Altuve, for example, he's got a light kick and it mm-hmm. looks like he has a lot of moving parts, but his swing, it's not really, he's got a lot of simplicity to his swing as well. Mm-hmm. I would agree. And you know what? I, I think too, timing is an interesting thing, right? Cause you have the timing of your body. Mm-hmm. How do I get my, my body to sequence in the correct order? Right. And when you talk about the leg kick and, and allowing someone to sit in their backside longer, allowing someone to get their chest forward a little bit more, all of that is enabling their timing to be in, in a much better position to create separation, create power and, and anything else. Um, that will also, I think, I think your stride in general, anytime someone moves their front foot is going to affect how they time up the pitch, the incoming pitch. Right. And some people feel very, a lot more comfortable having a bigger stride time. And some people like, you know, we see Bryce Harper too, completely getting rid of, um, the bigness or the uh, to a swing and, and going no stride sometimes and and working for that works for him in certain scenarios. So I think I think that is interesting. The two different aspects of timing, your sequencing, and then also just being able to time up the pitch. Yeah, we're going to be talking in the coming weeks a lot more about coaching, a lot more uh, about hitting and coaching topics here as we wrap up our series that we call it the championship season <laughs> episode nine. This is part five talking about the aftermath. Uh, great videos, great stuff. Be sure to follow Cassie and myself on Instagram, Twitter. I'm at Jim Tara on both Cassie on Instagram at coach underscore Cassie RB at coach 
Cassie RB on Twitter. Uh, the first one is Instagram <laughs> at coach underscore Cassie RB on Got Instagram. <laughs> let's, let's get into today's episode again, episode nine, talking about uh, the post championship celebration. I just want to know um, when you guys returned to that trailer, what, 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 and, and just back to your hotel, what, what went on? What was the post championship celebration like? Um, yeah. Did you guys keep going? What was what was that like for you, for your team? Yeah, I you know what we 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 won it so late, right? We by the time I think it was past midnight by the time the game actually finished after the rain blaze and everything else. Um, and it's those are one of those things where I remember moments from my first person point of view, and it is it seems so sporadic. I remember just like big moments. I don't remember the order how they happened because there's so much emotion emotion surrounding it. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen so many pictures and videos of that chip, right? You know, after it happened, I wanted to go back and watch all these pictures and videos. And I actually started to hesitate doing that because my memory of that moment became the pictures and videos I was watching afterwards, not actually what I was experiencing in the first person. But I remember, you know, just like little things like hugging my parents for the first time, leaving uh, this, all, all six seniors, leaving our cleats at Hall of Fame Stadium to signify that we were done playing. And um getting able, being able to just hold the trophy and be like, holy cow, this is, this is actually really heavy. Um, but, um, that was, you know, afterwards we get, we get, I remember we get on the bus. I, I, I don't remember where we might not have even stopped back into that locker room. I think we grabbed our bags and changed our shoes into our turfs and then went right on the bus and the support staff had gotten balloons and streamers and, you know, whatever else. And it, it, again, I, it, I was, I, I remember thinking a couple moments how different the other team's bus would have been at that time, how opposite emotions were happening within like a parking lot of each other. But um, just, you know, every now and then that moment of sadness hits you where you're like, you just played your last game. And then you look up and you're like, but we're celebrating now. And, and you, you know, <laughs> you, continue, you, you push past any sad moment. Right. Mm, um, yeah. So yeah, just, just a lot of laughs, a lot of fun moments, a lot of, you know, seeing family, seeing, seeing other teammates, getting texts and phone calls from people who were just following along the entire time. Oh, it was all definitely a whirl, whirlwind, but very, very cool. <laughs> yeah. Mind you, this was before the explosion of social media and the explosion of mm -hmm. Instagram. So uh, maybe you had like the first iPhone. So you were we, getting yeah, texts, right? Twitter, I mean, we had, yeah. we had Twitter, we had Twitter on yeah. everyone by my, by my senior year had a smartphone. That was like the first year everyone on our team had the smartphone. 2012. And, yeah. Yeah around that time so yeah you're right and because i think now like it would have been instagram live oh yeah TikTok live and whatever you else. see that with professional athletes now yes <laughs> and um not that anybody on our team did anything uh inappropriate or stupid or anything like that but that would have i think made me a little bit worried because you're you're not just representing like just a softball team in oklahoma like the university of alabama there's so much pride with class and there's so much pride with like the history of this this university that i would i would hate to ever be responsible for any tainting of that that crimson a <laughs> of course oh yeah what was it like when you when you hung up the cleats and and um so to speak uh, what were, what were you thinking then um did it hit you that it's all over or was that later on in, within the next few days i think it was well you know it was funny, re, you know, reliving that day and, and thinking about this podcast. I remembered I we didn't we didn't sleep right, so we get mm -hmm. done after midnight. We hadn't eaten since really lunch. We had some granola bars and stuff throughout the day, like throughout the night, but nobody really had dinner. We got to the field so early. We had the rain delay, so the only place in Oklahoma City open was an IHOP. Mm -hmm. That was like a twenty four hour, and we we ended up going there. Um, and my parents handed me a jar and they were like, we, you know, we were going to give this to you afterwards. And it was 101 things to look forward to in life after softball. Cause they knew oh, I was going to have a tough time yeah. of, uh, transitioning. And mm -hmm. it was more of like a cheer up, like, Hey, you can go skiing again. Cause you haven't done this since you started getting recruited in case you got hurt. You can, you know, wear other colors besides crimson and white. Mm -hmm. And just like, you know, it was, some of it was funny. Some of it was serious. It was, that was cool. And I remember, you know, getting back into the hotel, my roommate was a sophomore rising junior and uh, she got changed, showered right away. And I, it like, then it hit me. I was like, <gasps> like I saw, I saw my uniform on, right. We don't shower at the field. Right. So I'm back at the hotel sure. oh, yeah. the shower, yeah. and I, and I was like, I don't want to, I wasn't ready. It was like 3am and I was like, I'm not ready yet. So yeah. I went, you know, I think I went through my parents and that entire jar. I went through every 101 answer. I decided to unpack and repack my bag. And it was like 5 a.m. And my roommate's like, Cass, you have to 
shower like you have to take that off at some point <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah. um so i think that dirty hit, rainy yeah yes we were i mean it was it was a it was you smell bad right you smell like a wet dog a little bit because you've just been wet for yeah. the last hour <laughs> long it's, it's filthy yeah but like you know when you you undo your belt and dirt comes out like those yep. little i remember like every process of get, changing out of my uniform things were hitting me you know um and that was certainly emotional i remember boohooing as i did it like boohooing in the shower and it was such a mixed emotion of again, you just played your last game ever. And then you got to win it, right? Like you had two, two fighting emotions that were just extremely overwhelming. But um, yeah, that was, that certainly was a time that it hit me too. But uh, again, you, you, you had the ebbs and flows of that entire day of, of, of these highs and then like a little sadness and then highs and a little sadness. <laughs> I find the, um, the, the jar with the ideas very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, you say so many things, you know, when you're done, you say, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that now, or I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But you, you fall as an athlete, all athletes do this when that, that death occurs, so to speak, mm -hmm. you fall back into that routine just without the sport. And that's the hardest thing I think about transitioning. I think everybody has struggled with that. I think that's why Michael Jordan ultimately wanted to go play baseball, or at least uh, that was a part of it. That's why Tom Brady came, has come out of retirement because you stick to the basic same routine or you can't come up with another routine without the actual sport, without the out the actual game. Mm -hmm. And you say you're going to do all these ideas, but it, it takes you a while to for things to finally click. And some people, it never really does throughout their life. Sometimes they always just stay in that athlete's mind and they really don't do the things that they said that they're going to do. And that's okay. And they're happy with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's... Um that's so interesting. And I know we're going to get into depth of this a little bit more in a future episode, but um, yes, that I think I feared that transition before I ever got to it. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I say how like focused I was on the present. I was trying to take everything one day at a time. And I really do think it was just because if my brain started to float to like, well, what's going to happen when you're not playing anymore, that thought was so frightening to me that it just was like, Oh, I got to stay right here. I, I'm yeah. just playing a game right now. I'm playing a game right now. I'll deal with it when I get there. Um, but yeah, it, it 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 is funny. Like you know, reading over certain things, um, I I I I used to talk, and I still, I still talk to my athletes about developing an alter ego on the field. You know, you have some females in particular who are very sweet, very kind, very nice, like very prides themselves on just being like a very kind soul off the field. And I talk to them about how you, we can create an alter ego that gets us a little bit more into. Uh, you know what, I'm gonna, uh, I'm here to kick butt now, instead of it needing to be a passive uh, personality almost, and we call it the alter ego. Mm -hmm. And I do think every everybody has that little alter ego that they can access on the field. And I had a I had a coach ask me one time, they're like, what if what you are on the field is actually who you are, and your alter ego is just what you have to put on for everyone else when you get off the field? Yeah. What happens when you get done playing? And, and you do start to realize, like, it's not alter egos, it's just different identities that you probably attach to that all of a sudden you have to mourn the what your one identity, right? You have to mourn this one aspect of your life of a massive part of who you are and then start to try to figure out, all right, now what? Now, now who am I? Yeah. <laughs> it's very, very difficult for sure. Also too, you know, I think Jim Carrey once said that too, that, that, and again, I'm not trying to get dark here, but it's somewhat relatable where he said, depression is the cause of the avatar that you're mm -hmm. tired of playing that alter ego you're you're tired of playing and with athletes yes there is that that alter ego but i i do think that when you're on the field that is the most genuine person and and brand of what you really are the type of person that you are because you can express yourself any athlete any sport mm -hmm. in ways that you probably couldn't walking down the street no no nfl player you know cooper cup and stefan diggs um watching the other night and celebrate in the end zone they can't celebrate like that on the street people would look at them like they're really weird mm -hmm. but they're able to express their excitement in an athletic arena in an environment like that so you're really onto something when you talk about the alter ego of an athlete um and how close it is to who they really are when they're on the field and off the field it's almost like they have to come up with that alter ego um because they always say all the time, well, this, you know, this is what I'm really like off the field. Well, maybe it's really more like this is what you're really like as a person in mm. general, closest to who you are on the field rather than off. Yeah. I, you know, I've heard another example or uh, said another way is that 
you know, when you play on the field, you get to really just continue to keep that, that child in you alive. Yeah. Most of the time, the, the child like aspects of us usually die off as adulthood comes into play. Mm-hmm. And uh, so when you do get, you know, cause that is being able to like be genuinely excited and like celebrate with, without, with, without any, without holding back. Right. It's like this abandonment of like these restrictions that we feel like we place on ourselves to just, this is, this is how I am normally. Like I'm going to be relaxed, calm, but like you to actually go out and not have any of these restrictions. Yeah, that is, it, it, it is interesting. And how many times in your life do you feel like you can just trust yourself to just act and do and be and not second guess, not question, you know, and um, certainly like sheds light into like uh, states of flow and, and, and whatever else that may be. But yeah, that is, certainly something I was, I was, I was terrified of leading up to it. And, um, I, I, I have, to, I know for a fact, I'm not the only athlete who experiences that, that type of feeling either, you know, it, but uh, just a counterpoint with women and, and men, it's a little bit different because there is professional sports and there's always that carrot out there that's dangling. But with mm-hmm. women, you kind of know for the most part, when that end date is, when mm-hmm. it's going to be, you know, when that death, so to speak, is going, I hate using that word. I'm sorry. (laughs) When that death is going to occur Mm -hmm. where with men, a lot of times you don't. And sometimes with men, you, they crash a little bit harder, Mm -hmm. not, not to take away from, you know, your experience, but you do know there's that end date there, but it sounds like you weren't really preparing for it at all. You still weren't really prepared for it. No, no, definitely wasn't. Um, I, I mean, I had grad school set up. I I knew where I was going afterwards. I, I had those types of things set up, but um, yeah, really just was not mentally thinking about it, preparing for it, any of that. Um, I wanted to win the national championship so badly. That was, that was like the biggest thing. And then everything else was just going to kind of follow. And it really, it honestly probably wasn't until two weeks post, right? You, you do everything. And um, I had gone back down to Alabama to help work a camp and you start to relive some of that fun stuff. You get to be with your teammates again. But then at the end of camp, I moved out of my apartment, moved out of my locker. Mm-hmm. And that started to be very final where you're no longer a member of this team anymore. And yeah. now, and, and that's a whole nother identity too, right? Like, well, who's my team, right? Um, so yeah, that's, it was certainly like a process to, you know, recover out of that. But um, the, at least, at least the 24 hours following winning master championship and was, was very blissful. <laughs> Who did you lean on um, to get through this process of going from an athlete to now um, your second chapter of your life? Yeah, you know, it was it was uh, that was that was interesting because I, I I had moved to Iowa afterwards and I so badly wanted to call my teammates and and talk to the girls who were my teammates last year, but in the same breath, my teammates who were younger than me were now part of a team and. I knew from experience that like they needed to make their own team and they needed to do it without the identity of the national championship team. And Mm -hmm. so I almost felt like I needed to keep distance from that. Um, I had one, um, one of my senior teammates, Amanda Locke, she was the only other teammate who had moved out of the town of Tuscaloosa um, Mm -hmm. after getting done. But I moved to Iowa where I knew no one and went to grad school. And so I leaned probably more on my, um, my work and I, talk about trying to set up the same schedule, right? I'd wake up early. I'd go work out. I'd go work out at a, at the place I worked at night. So I actually continued Mm -hmm. taking swings because I just didn't know what else to do. (laughs) Still ate clean, (laughs) still went to class, did, did everything. And then I coached at night and I would, I would pack my day like 6am to 9pm. And then I'd go to bed. I'd be like, okay, that was a good day. But if I ever didn't have things to do, if I didn't have a busy schedule, if I didn't have a job, I started Mm -hmm. to get very restless and maybe that's why the book came about too. Cause I kept thinking about that team and needed something to do maybe, you know? Um, so I, I, yeah, when I finally moved home in the couple of years afterwards, it was certainly family and friends. Um, but, um, and, and our alumni is so great with the softball program. So it's definitely that, you know, all of them too, but it's, uh, it was, it was my work. Yeah. How, how did you map out that post career and with everything going on the summer after, how did you map it all out? What was the roadmap for that? Yeah, you know, um, there I, I I had I, I knew I was gonna work. I my parents had my parents are like the best of the best. Um, I had a bad engagement in my backyard since I was younger, and mm-hmm. so I put out there that I'd give lessons, and that was less about making money and more about just genuinely wanting to give back. I felt very indebted to the game. I still was in shock that I was almost allowed to experience what I was allowed to experience, and. Um, the talent, like, obviously I worked hard, but I didn't 
you know, there's a lot of people who work hard and, and didn't have the talent that I had, you know, and so I was just very overwhelmed by, I guess, that gratitude. And I wanted to perpetually try and, and, and just share everything I had learned. So um, definitely gave a ton of lessons, um, made, a, made a lot of day trips to see my family. And so, cause my, I have 11 cousins that are all younger than me. And um, mm-hmm. I had missed so many birthday parties, so many communions, so many graduation parties, so many, so many things because I had softball and I wanted to, I felt like I want to try to make it up for it in the summer essentially. So just hanging out with a lot of family and then, and then just preparing for my, my trip to Iowa or my, my time living in Iowa, uh, preparing for grad school. I thought I was going to be a biomechanist. And I thought I was going to work in a lab and I was, you know, obviously steered off course after a couple of years being there, but that's certainly what I was setting up. <laughs> well, it's worked out well. Yes, certainly. <laughs> what made you want to do what you're doing now, which is coaching? Um, I, when I got to grad school, um, I was paying for my grad school by giving hitting lessons at night and mm-hmm. realized at the end of the day that my favorite part of my day was not what I was in grad school for. My favorite part of my day was coaching. And, mm-hmm. um, I, I didn't know exactly what it was going to look like, but I knew I couldn't impact an athlete in the lab and whatever I was going to be doing, I had to be impacting the athlete. I didn't know if that was a mentorship, a coach. I didn't know what it was going to look like, but I just had to be in that realm. Um, I also was very torn about coaching college or coaching a team versus coaching privately. Um, But again, I I just knew I had to be involved in the game. And as an athlete, I didn't think I wanted to coach at all. (laughs) Yeah. It wasn't until the game was missing that I was like, okay, this is how I get back to it. You know, who did you lean on for mentorship with that? So Bridget Quimpo is currently the head coach of Ramapo in New Jersey. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's funny. She, we, we very like, I was a guest player for a team and I think she was like a guest coach for a team. And that was how we met when I was 15, 16. Um, so she has mentored me through, through high school, through training for Alabama, through, um, writing my book. She was the one who pushed me to write the book originally. Um, and certainly just phone calls with her because she was so passionate about the game, but she had experienced coaching in a private realm in a college realm and in so many different sectors. Um, leaned on my parents a ton there. You, you realize, I think as you get older, how much wisdom your parents do have when you start to like yeah. break away from like others telling me what to do. It's like, no, they know, <laughs> they know a lot. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, I feel like it was a combination of those two. And then, um, and then when I started working, obviously at my, my, my current facility, uh, my now business partner, I was, you know, he seemed to have very little affiliation and attachment to baseball after playing in college. And he was, he was, but he was supremely uh, passionate in strength and conditioning and human movement. And I was like, huh, you can be, you can find that same passion, maybe just in a different category. And that was, you know, certainly who I leaned on as well. Also had a insane work ethic and we kind of aligned very well with our wanting to just have our days packed all day. (laughs) So the summer of 2012, let's, let's say August, Mm -hmm. did you ever envision 10 years later, you're sitting here on a, Saturday morning as we record doing a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot. You know, you broke, you broke up for a second there, but I'm assuming you, you asked if I would I, ever envision. <laughs> did you ever envision 10 years later doing a podcast? <laughs> no, no. With I don't even know. People. Podcasts were, were, uh, you know, I know they were things, but they weren't the thing they are now. But um, I, I, I All had the cool sharing now. the game and that if this is the medium to do it with, I'm, I'm, I'm game. Well, I do appreciate you going through this. And one of the reasons that I do these two, we do these podcasts, this one cross functionality, be sure to subscribe, Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon music, and on YouTube, softball strength Academy to watch the show again, cross dash functionality. Uh, the reason we do this and the reason we do the lab Epstein hitting podcast, one of the biggest reasons is to, in a way, give back, but we, we want to give back to the parents, your parents, my parents, all the parents out there, baseball and softball who travel with their kids, travel ball in the summer, the spring ball. They work out in the cages, especially in the Northeast where you are in New York and in the wintertime training, getting ready for that season. Sure, those kids are playing other sports. I understand that. They're playing soccer. They're playing basketball. But ultimately, the parents and the kids are looking forward to that six-month journey of spring ball and then travel ball. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it feels like or it could feel like, especially I guess it's, it's a thing in baseball, and a thing in softball it could feel like a lonely place and you feel like that there's not many people out there who do what you do and who are living that type of lifestyle 
but this podcast is there to reassure that there are people with that same type mindset. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. So, so this is, this, yes. And shoot, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy it every week and I'm appreciative of it. And uh, if anyone's listening has questions and wants to reach out or pass this along, feel free to do so. Jimbo podcast 21. If you have questions at gmail.com, by the way, Jimbo podcast 21 <laughs> at gmail.com. Um, and yes, of course, follow us on social media. We gave you the socials earlier. Uh, I'm at Jim Tara, Twitter and Instagram. On Instagram, Cassie is coach underscore Cassie RB, Twitter, coach Cassie RB. All right, next week, um, some untold fun stories. We did some uh, introspective of uh, the last few weeks of um, the final championship season. We're going to do some untold stories, though, from your four years at the University of Alabama, some fun stuff and some things, of course, that maybe you have not shared before. We're going to do that next week. Be sure, of course, to um, subscribe to my other podcast, The Lab Dash epstein hitting podcast this week uh, jake is out and he had a lot to do with the lab bcs so i had on ricky reimold who uh happens to be the pitching coach for mizzou he was a scout for um the cardinals and he was with the mets for a while as their pitching coordinator he's a friend of mine so i'm really looking forward to that do you have anything to promote Nothing, nothing coming up right now. The three, our three companies, our main one is Athletes Warehouse. So at Athletes Warehouse or excuse me, athletes.warehouse on Instagram is our strength and conditioning portion of our company. At Velo University, no spaces, no dashes is uh, our throwing portion. And then at Softball Strength Academy is obviously my baby. That is the hitting portion of, uh, of, our, of our place. So, and if you're ever in the Pleasantville area, shoot us uh, a message and, and come by, come see us. All right, good stuff. Episode 10 next week. We will talk to you then. Please subscribe. Have a great